Hey guys, Agnard here. Hope you and your family are doing well. In today's video, we're gonna talk about water sources for your homestead. And so this is a pretty hot topic, uh, especially in the middle of summer when you're in drought conditions and you need to water your livestock or your crops or your garden. And uh, so we made a list of the different types of sources and uh, how they're available, the pros and cons of each. And, uh, you know, so uh, we're going to go from there. Here we go. Okay, so let's talk about water usages first. So w why are you needing water? Is it to water your livestock? Is it to irrigate your crops or trees? Is it to spray chemicals, fertilizers, both synthetic and non-synthetic? Or the most basic for your home, you know, providing water for your home, your plumbing, your consumption, all those different kinds of things. So. Uh, identify what that looks like for you and uh, and then take it from there but the first source is your your community water your municipality uh, a co-op and uh, you know it's piped down our road uh, you know in most in most areas it's there's a water source available at your road depending on how rural you are uh, obviously there are some areas that are so rural that there is no um, community water so so that's that's definitely a con there, but uh, in in most places you can get to it right off the road. Uh, obviously, you'll have to ship it, uh, plumb it, pipe it uh, to wherever you need it on your operation on your homestead. But some of the pros is it's easy and readily available. Like I said, it's right at your road. Um, it's typically treated, so it's very clean. It does have some chlorine, uh, which can be a pro and a con. Um, I know that when I make my compost tea. You look at that and you can't have chlorine because it will kill the, the, the uh, microbes and whatnot that's in that tea. So, so pros and cons there. Uh, some other cons as far as community water is there's, there's a cost associated with it. And uh, regardless of how much water you use, there is a minimum fee. Um, and obviously, the more you use, the more you pay. Um, it can be restrictive during droughts or um, different types of use. I know that in my area that, you know, once we hit a certain stage on a drought uh, monitor, they'll, they'll restrict irrigation. So know that that's, um, that can happen and they'll come in and do that. Um, and then uh, another area to, con to think about, and this is in a lot of the different water sources, is the water quality. Is it... Um, you know, wherever that water comes out of in the earth, it's subjected to uh, the minerals in that in that area. So if there's an area where there's a high salt content, uh, you know, it's probably going to pick that up in the water and uh, all the way to your house. And um, and of course, it's going to uh, come out when you when you when you irrigate. If you're it may not be a big deal if you're worried about your, your livestock. But uh, if you're getting crops, then, then absolutely. And this ex next example is river um, or creek or brook or stream, um, just depending on where you live. Once again, because it's running and it's moving, it's, it's typically very clean. There's not a worry, uh, typically not too much of a worry of, of large amounts of bacteria buildup. Uh, obviously, there'll be minimal restrictions. If we're in drought type conditions, that water source might deteriorate. Um, you know, those are a couple of pros there. A couple of cons is you cannot restrict the downstream flow of it. If you want to have a large water source and you've got a creek, creek, river, whatever, you can't dam it up and restrict the flow from your neighbor. Um, your neighbor wants, it's, it's okay with you using some of that water, but obviously he doesn't want you to, uh, to um, restrict his use. So make, make, uh, be aware of that. Uh, once again, the water quality is subjective to the minerals from the uh, underground reservoir or aquifer where it derives from. We have some places on our property that we, uh, it, it's, it's a spring fed and, and you can literally see it bubbling out of the ground. And it is so cool to see. It's just, it just makes you feel good when you see it, knowing that that's bubbling out of the ground. And uh, knock on wood, we've not seen those completely diminish uh, in, uh, severe droughts. And I'm talking about the, the great drought of 2011, where the, it's like everything was burning up. 
hopefully we won't see that again, but I'm afraid climate change is, is going to have an effect on all of these homestead water options. And, uh, and so knowing that, being proactive about it is, is very important. Okay, can have unacceptable levels of algae and bacteria, um, for which can restrict your crop irrigation and your livestock usage. Uh, we kind of delved into that. You know, let's say you're growing lettuce, and and so whatever you're irrigating that lettuce with, if there's a, a bad bacteria in there, it can that plant can absorb those bacteria, and you know you hear the ooh, uh, ooh <laughs> the E. coli recalls for the different types of. Um, lettuces out there or different vegetables and and so there's there this is not the main one but this is one of the reasons that you can that you can get that so another con is is uh size of the creek um is it is it large enough to to uh, fulfill all your needs and once again it can be a, um, ineffective or, or dry up during a, a bad drought so river creek creek uh brook stream um that's our, our second water source. Uh, obviously, the next one is water well. Um, obviously, you know, when you talk about water sources, self-sustaining, uh, non-reliant or dependent. And, uh, and so, yes, water wells are good, great for the off-griders. Um, can be plug-in, It can you know, where you're on the grid, you know, electric grid. Or it can be a solar where you're completely off-grid. Or it can be a hand pump. And so uh, there's a couple options there. Cons, you don't know when you go to drill a well, and obviously drilling a well is very expensive. You don't know if you're going to find water when you drill that well. I know that when we put our water well in, we went 462 feet. And mind you, you pay this stuff by the foot. You, you pay that driller, and that's how he makes his living. And, and you know, he's in it for, uh, to make a profit, uh, and, and so he's going to charge you for every foot he goes. I know there's some of these guys, these dousers, these uh, water witchers and all this kind of deal. And uh, more power to them. We tapped into um, the, the aquifer uh, in our area. And, and it's, you know, typically they have a good idea of how deep it is and where it's at. So it's, it's kind of more of a science to it. But it doesn't mean it's completely accurate. So as I said, we had to go 462 feet where we are. Uh, but you don't you don't know when you're doing that how far you're going to have to go down or if it's going to be good water. There's different stratas, different layers of, of water uh, um, underground, and some of them, as you heard me say, has has um, can have. It's dependent on the mineral content where that water's coming from or where that aquifer's flowing through. And so I was very fortunate. But uh, is it does it have a an effect where it raises the pH? So. Those minerals in that aquifer and, and the um, uh, minerals where that water is coming from can have an effect uh, on your um, water quality. And, and so here's number five. Uh, all wells are reported to the state and feds. So for you and off-gridders and uh, those guys that, that want to be um, off the network, this is this is... This is something, you know, they, they know your water well. They know your measurements. Um, if, if there's droughts, and that's another one, can be restrictive during droughts. If you're sitting there watering and, you know, everything else is bone dry, brown, and they do a flyby and you have the prettiest green crops and you're, you're out there irrigating, man, they're going to come knock on your door. And, uh, and so, you know, know that those things that can happen. Wells can dry up and become ineffective during droughts. Here, more as more and more water wells are, are being drilled, uh, climate change equates to falling aquifer levels. So know that that can be a con, and that there is no consistent. Oh, I've got this water well, and it'll last forever. Uh, then the next one: lake, pond, tank, reservoir, whatever you want to call it. Once again, this is another one of those uh, geographical name um, where you live. What you're going to call it? I, I want to say here in East Texas, we typically call our little what we call ponds, other people, uh, Panhandle, West Texas, they call them tanks. Uh, some people call them reservoirs. Some people might call them small lakes or big lakes, whatever, whatever that may be. Uh, pros of that, once again, minimal government restrictions, uh, and it can be a very abundant supply depending on uh, how your your um, your pond, your lake is is um, is refreshed with water. 
It can be a spring, obviously. Uh, it can be a part of a creek, uh, a creek stream that, that does that, and you have a spillway that allows the water to fall through. And uh, like our pond, it's not necessarily a spring, but it's on the side of our, our hill. And, and so there's like a hundred plus foot elevation from the top of our hill to where our pond is. And so it gets a lot of seep out of that hill and it, um, it, it stays uh, plentified. We, I remember in the great drought of 2011, um, it did not go dry. Now it was a mud hole. It was not an abundance of water, but nonetheless, it, um, uh, it maintained and uh, so that's just for our area uh, the cons of that just that is water quality can be limited um, obviously the lower it gets the the worse quality it's going to be it, you know once it gets to muddy yuck livestock aren't going to want to drink that you can't um, put that on your crops uh, because a there's not abundance and b it's just so yucky um, and uh, just actual the, the pumping of it. Do you have a means to pump it can be a restriction to some. You know, I know that there's some guys that, that use uh, what they call these things as trash pumps. Have a little Briggs and Stratton motor on there. They put a little hose in there and they, man, they go to town. So, um, you know, you can buy them at Harbor Freight for a couple hundred bucks, I think. So rock on, man. That's cool. I know that I was thinking about going that process if my water... A test my water sample was uh was bad for the the salts when i go to do blueberries i was i was thinking about um taking that approach but uh but i'm not going to have to once again uh unacceptable level levels of algae and bacteria uh for crop irrigation and, and livestock use you need to be able to test for that the test that we got done for our water well uh was just minerals I did not opt to have the algae bacteria piece to that, but that is um, that is another option that you, you can get done. They can test that. Um, and so the last con that I have there for lake, pond, tank, uh, reservoir is it can be ineffective during droughts. As I said, mine stayed, uh, have a little water in there uh, during the great drought of 2011. There were other folks that their, their um, tank, pond, reservoir completely dried up it was horrible um that that 2011 year and it and it, it took a couple of years to really get to fully recovered from it uh the next one is rainwater collection um hey look you know there's there is no government restrictions on on you um putting gutters on your barn or your house and putting those in a tank and and holding on to that uh man you you just about can't get any cleaner than rainwater. And, and I remember when I was a kid growing up, you know, in the 70s and 80s, you know, there was a lot of talk about acid rain and all that. So, yes, there, there is, it's still not going to be 100% uh, pure. I don't think anything in our earth is 100% pure. Um, but it's typically very clean. It's typically a very good water source. Once again, high level of water quality. Uh, we'll have minerals and chemicals but b will be very minimal works great if you can utilize a gravity feed uh top scenario so we have our great big hill man i've thought about um building um some different structures up there and collecting that water get me you know a couple thousand gallon tanks and um and then built me a a, a, pump, a, a pipeline down to where where i do up to the barn and where i do some of my uh my different um, garden and experimental places, my blackberries, blueberries, lavender, Christmas trees, all those different things. And it'll all be fed off of gravity. That's the point I'm trying to make. It would all be fed off of gravity. And, uh, and so that's an option. But it, once again, the, um, the cons of that is you must have a system to collect it. You must have a system to pump it. Uh, and you must have hoses and piping and all those different things to do it. It also requires storage containers, and those storage containers are not cheap. Um, they they are very expensive. In the in the COVID time of limited resources and limited drivers and shipping containers and you know on and on, it's just it's crazy. Know that if you have those containers, there's a certain way you have to do those containers. Obviously, you want to restrict the sunlight because it will um, 
allow for algae and bacteria uh, to, to build up and grow. Uh, once again, restricting irrigation and um, livestock usage. There are chemicals that you can use to treat the water as it's in storage, depending on, on how long you have it in storage. And, um, and once again, once you're in a drought, it becomes ineffective because there's no rain in droughts. And so it's a limited resource. Um, but it beats just running off and going to the Gulf of Mexico. What I'm saying is it, having some sort of water collection is good versus watching it go to the Gulf of Mexico. And the last water option I have here is transporting water. Um, whether you uh, transport it yourself or you hire a, a truck. I mean, there's guys that do nothing but just tote water. They have a big truck, um, they fill it up and they, uh, they take it to wherever you need it. There's a cost for that. Hey, fuel in cheap, man, you, you can't get, I can tell you right now, you can't hire um, a CDL driver for less than 20, 30 bucks an hour um, without the price of the vehicle. So it gets, um, it gets expensive. When you, uh, when you do that, you, you're not only paying for the, um, uh, the transportation fee, but you're also paying for the water. Um, you know, there's a, there, it can be excessive. And then again, do you know what water you're getting? And, uh, and so those are the three things I have is that, um, for the cons, it can, uh, the cost can become excessive. Uh, for the price of the water, the cost can be excessive for the transport fees. And that's whether you're transporting it yourself and you must have a container. And so here's a picture of, of uh, when, uh, when we first got the farm, we did not have any electricity at our barn. Um, we did not have a water well. All we had was our pond as well as water at our house, which was on the other side of the property. And so we used to use that container to, um, life, to water livestock uh, when we had them in different paddocks, as well as try to water some trees in, in, in major drought conditions. You know, you put out, I think our tote is like a 275 gallon IBC tote. And so you fill that puppy up, you know, that's, you do that every day. It, it, it's, um, you know, it can keep a tree or two alive. So, so anyway, that's what I have here for the small farm homestead water options and, um, you know, uh, I hope this video is useful, but, uh, but anyhow, hope that helps. God bless you and your family. Agnard out.